Hi, I'm Charlie Garcia. I'm a senior at MIT, and this summer I'll be working on a liquid-fueled rocket engine. Okay, before we get started, brief disclaimer. Rockets are dangerous. You can get seriously injured or even die if you do this wrong. I've had experience handling high-pressure systems, cryogenic fluids, and other rocket engines before. This is also the second bipropellant rocket engine I've built. Two summers ago, a uh, friend and I built this little rocket engine. It ran at uh, 90 psi, uh, chamber pressure, and about 7 pounds of thrust. Don't take anything I say as the gospel, though. If you attempt a similar project, you need to do your own research to ensure that you understand your own system, design, personal abilities and experience, as well as your own risk posture. With all that out of the way, let's design a rocket engine. Okay, the very first thing we need to do is pick a propellant. If you're at a real rocket company like SpaceX or Blue Origin, you'd pick a propellant by doing a complex, high-level trade study to see what the different costs and benefits of using different propellants would be. But since I'm a hobbyist, I'm just going to pick something that's cheap, easy to get my hands on, and is going to look cool. So I went ahead and picked ethanol as my propellant for this rocket engine. Ethanol is great for me because you can dilute it with water to help keep the engine cool if I have thermal problems later in the design process. Ethanol is also relatively easy to get a hold of and relatively cheap. Now for an oxidizer, there's really only a couple of choices here, and I went ahead and chose liquid oxygen as my oxidizer because I'm comfortable handling cryogenic fluids. If you aren't comfortable with cryogenic fluids, or you have other design criteria, nitrous oxide is also a commonly chosen oxidizer at the hobby scale. Nitrous has its own problems though that I don't want to deal with, so I'm going to go ahead and use liquid oxygen, which is a little bit higher performance too. Great, that was easy. Now we have our propellants, so now we have some thermochemistry to do. So our two propellants are here. We have ethanol and liquid oxygen. So ethanol will combust with three molecules of liquid oxygen to produce three water molecules and two carbon dioxide molecules. If you burn one mole of each of these propellants, you will release 1,145 kilojoules of energy. So if you do out the math, you can see that this releases about 32.25 kilojoules per kilogram of propellant burned in the engine. Note, this is the maximum amount of energy you'll release if you stoichiometrically burn the propellants. So rocket engines typically run a little fuel rich to pr improve their performance because the exhaust products are a little bit lighter, but you won't get any extra energy. So we now know how much energy has been released during these combustion reactions. And we can use this to estimate the performance of the rocket engine. Now we can estimate the combustion temperature of the reaction by knowing some specific properties of the products of the previous combustion reaction. Now that we've got this rearranged, I've plugged in the specific heats of our two reaction products. Uh, that's the carbon dioxide and the water, and then this is the temperature that the propellants are at initially, and this is the temperature of combustion. So if we go ahead and work the math, you can see that this is 3,030 degrees Kelvin. So now that we know that the combustion temperature, uh, we can use the relationship between the temperature, which is just an average of the kinetic energy of the particles in the exhaust, uh, to estimate what the final exhaust velocity of those gases will be. So we're going to start with this equation, and we can really quickly rearrange that into that. Now there's a little bit of hand-waving in here because remember that we won't be running this rocket engine at exactly the perfect stoichiometric ratio, and also the products leave with some energy, so just calculating it based on the uh, maximum enthalpy of the propellants is not going to give you a perfectly correct answer, but we actually get a pretty good answer. And this gives you an exhaust velocity of about 2200 meters a second. So this is how quickly the gas is going to be leaving the rocket engine, on average, more or less. And you can use this to estimate the thrust of the rocket engine, because you know how much propellant you're pumping into the rocket engine. Now this is a first order estimate, but it's a pretty good one. These numbers are within 10% or so of the NASA CEA solver that they make available for free to the public. So the next thing to do when you're designing a rocket engine is to pick a thrust level. And it, once again, if you were working for Blue Origin or SpaceX or a large company, you would probably be given this thrust level, or more likely you wouldn't even be doing this process. What you would do is you would pick an already developed engine and add an appropriate number of them to your launch vehicle in order to get its thrust to weight ratio high enough that it can actually leave the ground and go to space. Uh, for this engine, however, uh, we want to pick a thrust level that's high enough so we don't have to work with something really small, but also small enough that it fits within my budget. So my sizing process was basically to pick the largest rocket engine that I could reasonably afford to build. And for me, that turned out to be about 1,200 pounds of thrust. So this is the equation for thrust, and the very first thing we're going to do is cross this term out. This term accounts for what happens if your exhaust isn't perfectly at atmospheric pressure when it leaves the rocket engine. And since we're going to design the nozzle for at least a little while longer, we can ignore that. This term, however, is of relevant use to us because we know our thrust level that we want, which is 1,200 newtons, or about 5.5 kilonewtons. And we know that is equal to 2,200 meters a second times our mass flow. 
And so we know that our mass flow is going to be about 2 kilograms per second of liquid oxygen and ethanol propellant. So how do we get from some sketchy first order math into a finished rocket engine design like this? Well, there's a whole lot of other things to think about, and I'll be talking about those in upcoming videos if people are interested. Upcoming videos could talk about things like combustion chamber design, injector design, tube layout, plumbing considerations, instrumentation, manufacturing, testing, and finally hot firing the engine. If people are really interested on specific topics, we could go more in depth, or I could just show off the engine if it works. If it works. If you're interested in following along with this project, you can click the subscribe button. I can't promise that there will be another video anytime soon, but if there is, it might be interesting. Anyway, thank you for watching this brief introduction to liquid rocket engine design, and I hope you enjoy!